Thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, I see there's a lot of uh, good uh, notes in the chat going, so please uh, tell us where you're joining from, us from. It's always really fun to see where, where our audience is at the moment. So um, welcome to tonight's event. Um, make sure also, since, since we're kind of in, in the Zoom mode, uh, make sure to switch uh, the chat toggle to everyone versus host and panelists. Uh, if you want your message to be seen by the whole audience, um, just just. Uh, but if you want uh, the panelists, uh, you can obviously toggle that. But that's only going to be visible by the by the folks behind. Um, so welcome to today's event, uh, the Design Book Conversation, New York Subway Map, uh, New York Subway Map Debate. To be more precise. My name is Alexander. I am the curator of the Herb LeBallon Study Center of Design and Typography at the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. Uh, it's, it's my little inside joke that it's probably the longest title for uh, an, an organization, which we're hopefully very proud of. Um, but it's our pleasure to be hosting today's discussion. Uh, a little bit about LeBallon Center. Uh, the center opened in 1985. Uh, as a study center, uh, which was created in order to preserve uh, the unprecedented resource, the collection of material done by Herb LeBallon and his collaborators over the span of 40 years of time. The goal was to provide the design community with access uh, to the work in order to honor uh, his uh, history, his legacy, and be able to, to see things up close. Um, the collection has grown since then. It is approximately, contains about 60,000 pieces, maybe close to 70,000 pieces of material and we have about 150 years of graphic design represented here. So it's one of the best collections of graphic design in the world. We hope you um, come and visit us one day. We have uh, material from incredibly famous designers like Elaine Lester Cohen, uh, of course, Massimo and Lele Vignelli. Uh, we also have a very great collection of pulp paperbacks and trade paperbacks and just paperbacks in general, which, which Jesse and I uh, very much connect over. Um, we also have obviously the subway maps, but um, and including the famous uh, Vignelli map, which is the subject of, of the debate discussion, as well as uh, the maps that John had designed for uh, the MTA as well and for his own firm. So thank you, John, for supplying us with, with some of your material. The collection is free to visit. Uh, it's also an open archive. So we have uh, basically all of the collection is available to see. Um, but we're also here because of Cooper Union, which, which we're very big part of. And so if you're not familiar, Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art was established in 19, uh, sorry, 1859. We have to go back a century. Uh, it's among nation's oldest and most distinguished institutions of higher education. College was founded by inventor, industrials, and philanthropist Peter Cooper. Uh, it currently offers world-class education in art, architecture, engineering, humanities, and social sciences. But specifically, the reason why we're here is the famous Great Hall, uh, uh, which was the largest secular meeting room in New York City that opened soon after Cooper Union was open. The Great Hall has an incredible history, uh, including an appearance by a relatively unknown to New York at the time, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the speech he gave here, which is, is typically called the uh, uh, right makes might um, uh, speech, helped him win the election. You'll hear a little bit about the history of, of Great Hall in today's event and, and, and its role in the book that we're discussing. Um, to get started, I wanted to introduce tonight's moderator, an editor and publisher of the book, uh, New York Subway Debate, Gary Hustwit. Uh, to many of you, he needs no introduction. But Gary is a filmmaker, a visual artist. He's worked in publishing and at the amazing SST record label in the late 80s for all of the fans of Husker Du, Black Flag, Sonic Youth out there. Um, he's a filmmaker, as, sorry, and as a filmmaker, he's produced 13 feature documentaries, including the great uh, award-winning documentary about the band Wilco called I Am Trying to Break Your Heart. He also produced the HBO documentary about the gospel and soul music legend Mavis Staple called Mavis. He's also produced several design documentaries, uh, including the design trilogy Helvetica Objectified Urbanized, and also the ROMs 
film uh, about the design uh, legend Dieter Rams. And most recently, uh, he uh, made a short documentary called Map, which brings us all the way full circle to tonight. Uh, with that, I will pass it on to Gary to take it away. Hey, um, thanks so much, uh, Sasha, and thank you for all of you um, joining this. This is so cool to see hundreds of people from all over the world um, tuning in. Um, there are some amazing um, panelists here joining us, and I'm going to um, briefly introduce everyone to you. Um, so maybe we can go to the gallery mode and see uh, see the rest of the uh, rest of the group. Or I can just keep talking. <laughs> can we switch views? Are we in gallery? Yes, we're switched. <laughs> oh, we are. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm the one who's not seeing it. Um, so I'm going to kind of everybody here has a connection to um, this the book project in some way. So I'm going to kind of uh, go around and um, and introduce each one of them. And then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the book project started. And then we'll kind of get into deeper into um, this, the, the debate and kind of everything that, that has followed. So um, I'll start out with, uh, I guess, the, the, the person who got me started in this, uh, this journey, <laughs> um, which is uh, Felipe Memoria uh, from Work & Co, who I collaborated with um, to make this short film, The Map, which was about um, Work & Co's uh, digital redesign of the New York subway map. Felipe, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have uh, a, a trilogy of amazing uh, archivists, um, starting with uh, Jennifer Whitlock at the Vignelli Center for Design Studies up in uh, Rochester at RIT. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, thanks for having archivists on a panel. It's so awesome. <laughs> archivists are the best. I mean, come on, this is where all the good stuff is. Just, just you know, and you're, you're, you're uh, uncovering it all and, and, you know, making it accessible to us. And then we have Chilin and Mary, who are both from Cooper Hewitt, or Cooper, Cooper Union, sorry, and also the um, Voices from the Great Hall project. Hi, Mary and Chilin. Hi. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Well, fact, the Cooper Hewitt used to be at the Cooper Union, so that's not far off. Really? Oh, I didn't even know that. Well, yeah. sorry. <laughs> uh, and. Of course, we have um, the, one of the original uh, subway map debate participants, Mr. John Tarnak here as well. John, thank you for joining us. And then uh, one of my collaborators on publishing and designing the book, uh, Jesse Reed from Order and Standards Manual. Jesse, thanks for being here. Well, you don't have to unmute. Oh, yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> so cool. So um, I'm going to just give you a, a brief uh, little summary of how this the book project um, came into being. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk more with each of the participants. Um, so as Sasha said, I'm a, a design filmmaker. And uh, last year, I got the opportunity to collaborate uh, with Work & Co on um, a short film called The Map, which is following their digital redesign of the, the New York subway map. Um, through my research on that on this project, I mean, I was familiar with the map um, and, uh, you know, a little bit of what had happened in the 70s uh, when I interviewed uh, Massimo Vignelli um, in 2005, initially for, for Helvetica. Um, he had talked about the map and a little bit about the debate. Um, but I, I was trying to kind of research it a little bit more. And at, at that time last year, there wasn't still very much information about the debate itself. Um, there were a few uh, like basically like pull quotes from uh, the debate that had been published in the New York Times and the New Yorker um, back in the 70s. Uh, and um, and then there were um, these archives like I had already knew Jennifer from the Vignelli uh, Center and had asked her like what what debate material is 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 in there and she had provided me with a lot of information um uh and one of the things was a a, a proof sheet or several proof sheets of photographs by uh, uh that had been taken that night by um a guy named um stan reese so i kind of 
looked up Stan and you know found that uh, he was still around and he, he did not remember taking the photographs that that evening but uh, but he said if my name's on it I, they, I must have taken them they, they, I'll, I'll, I can look for the negatives and you know I, I, I you know I have no idea where they are but uh, got back to me um, uh, a few days later and said you're never gonna believe it I first box that I opened I found the the negatives that they, they had never been published photographs of this evening um, and you know, this had always been to me, to me, this kind of pivotal, legendary event in design history. Um, but I, you know, I'd never really seen any photographs of it. Um, at the same time, I uh, reached out to some of my friends at the Balance Center and and Cooper Union, uh, Mike Essel and Sasha, and I just asked the same thing: like, does any record, like, is any recording of this thing exist? And they were like, oh yeah, you know this. Voices from the Great Hall project has just started, and you know I think they're going through and trying to find these, um, you know, and restore these recordings. And and sure enough, the recording of the debate existed, and no one had 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 heard it. No one had, um, you know, kind of heard it. It was a two-hour uh, recording. Um, so both those kind of discoveries happened in the same week um and that's when i kind of started thinking oh this would be cool to just put this in a in a in a book just this one night um you know two hours uh in design history that was sort of um you know un unknown up to that you know for 40 plus years um you know how cool would it to be you know to have a little thing like this that could you know you could read about it and at least kind of um you know get an idea of what had happened on this night so that was the start of the um, of the project, uh, and like I said, the the um, the Cooper Union archives and the Cooper libraries and the the you know recording from the uh, the Voices of the Great Hall project were really the the you know the, the key to this. So um, I'd love to talk to um, Chilin and Mary just about maybe the history of the of the whole recordings, how these came into being, and um, and how specifically this one. Uh, uh, showed up i i, I had a um when i first talked to liz there I, I had a very um romantic uh idea of them sort of in a dusty you know dusty basement somewhere you know thousands of recordings uh languishing um and it, but that wasn't that far from the truth was it well um let's see <laughs> see <laughs> you go ahead Tyler. Oh, no, I mean it was um, it was all in the in our AV department, but um, it was carefully stored in a box. Maybe that's dusty a little bit, but <laughs> but it wasn't completely ignored. <laughs> but how many recordings were there? We have um, for the uh, we have about six uh, nine thousand recording oh actually six thousand recordings in um total for all the events that has happened in gray hall mm -hmm. yeah um shylin and and liz really spent you guys spent years sort of collecting and digitizing and cataloging all of these all of these recordings and the items that went with them that were in the archive um do you guys want to see the site should we show it to you gary oh yeah yeah, so as part of this project, going back and digitizing all these recordings and making them public, now they've been put on online, so people can go and, and listen. How, how many of the recordings are, are up on the website now? We now have about 600 uh, audio and visual recordings online that, that, have, that people have direct access. We have reports of about uh, 3,000 Grey Hall programs. Um, that that has taken place since 1941. Actually, the earliest recordings that we found incidentally took place um, 80 years ago today. It's a um, recording by the philosopher and psych psychologist John Dewey. Uh, it's titled "In Philosophy." So, and everything that's not available here, you know, we have um, we just don't have copyright for so people can contact us and we can send it to them similarly to how Chilin sent sent the subway debate to you yeah um now it was uh at some point was wnyc the radio station was was broadcasting these this was like a regular thing they broadcasted the debates from the great hall 
it was um, the Cooper Union Forum. That's where the um, all these pro lecture programming to, uh, took place in Gray Hall is called. And from 1949 on, we've um, the forum like collaborate with WMYC and it's been um, and it's been broadcast weekly for all the programs that, that took place in that in that season and also the these programs are also distributed na nationally in the uh, NAEB the National American National um, yeah I'm not gonna I'm gonna type in the chat so I'm not gonna embarrass myself <laughs> <laughs> And then yes, just yesterday you said you you now the the subway debate recording is now um, online, right? We are decided to actually go live yesterday. That so um, they are now That's... really available. We did you do we put chat? Uh, we'll put the link on the chat so everybody can go and take a look at this. Site. That's great. That's great. They don't have to listen to it right now, but they can listen to it <laughs> later. What I thought was interesting was that when I first listened to it, um, it starts off of the first couple minutes are have seemed like they were gone and it starts off in the middle of Vignelli's uh, presentation. It happens in a lot of recordings when they um, they sort of have to it's still recorded on the real audio reels so there are the times to put on the tapes and then to hit recording or changing tapes so there's usually some gaps but i don't think we're that far off <laughs> yeah yeah um it's so cool that that this this project is is um exists and that and, and then like i i had heard that at some point the tapes were going to be thrown away and that someone um what was his name? Oh, Winston Wilkerson, who was who... Um, yeah. Winston saved the day. Um, and and Paul Tomello, who is is um, sort of learned at Winston's feet and is now the new Winston, has has been carrying the torch, um, keeping keeping everything safe and sound in the AV department. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. so these were almost thank, almost thank threatened, goodness. almost trash. Yeah. We need well, early... institution to about history earlier on they were actually um very carefully cataloged and, and distributed to the library because they were all always recorded by the av department and that's how they were always the the steward to the mm -hmm. to the um, tapes mm -hmm. that's so cool it's so great that now everybody can go on and, and listen to this as well um i'll parts of it are i know are are this classic thing like the, during the Q&A, the people in the audience don't have microphones, so they're just kind of saying it so they didn't really come across on the um, uh, on the tape as much. But um, but it, I think it's it's a uh, it's a great to be able to maybe read along and listen to it if you if you if you have the book. Um, I, I'd love to talk a little now with um, with Jennifer at the at the Vignelli Center because um, you know, this debate was uh, uh, about the the, the Vignelli, uh, Vignelli Associates map that uh, had been introduced in 1972, and then kind of the reaction to it by um, people like John Tornak, who's with us tonight. Um, but Jennifer, maybe you could tell, talk a little bit about um, the history of Vignelli's working with the MTA and just what kind of how we got to the point in that late 60s, early 70s, where there was a, a, a debate about this this map. Sure. Um, Unimark International, where Vignelli was one of the founders, um, got the commission to do the signage for the subway in 1966. And he and Bob Norda, who were partners at the Unimark Milan office, and then Vignelli went and headed up the New York office, but they worked together across continents um, to make the New York subway signage, which resulted in 1970 with this the huge subway manual that's so infamous now, thanks to Jesse and his gang. Um, and, um, but also in 1970, they got a contract to do a map for the New York subway. And we have a photocopy of the, the original contract with the MTA in the, in the archives. And um, it, it, let me get it right. 
they they desired to develop a more attractive and readable subway map. <laughs> um, <laughs> And they pick Unimark because they had considerable experience in doing signage. And I think that's largely due to Bob Norda, a few years before he joined Unimark, had done the Milan subway. Um, they also is a note in the contract that it, the cost is not to exceed $17,600. It's very specific. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, and so the, they worked on that map, but then the Vanellis left and formed Vanelli Associates at the end of 1971, and the map wasn't published until 1972. And like some of the details of that are a little fuzzy to me. Um, there's not a lot of documentation of that in the archives, but um, at some point that map went with them to Vanelli Associates and they finished it and produced it from there. Mm -hmm. and, and something that I think is always worth noting, too, is that um, there was a, a young uh, designer, Joan Charison, mm -hmm. who had been at, at um, Unimark and came over with Vignelli, who did the actual execution of the, the graphic design of the map. Right. That's that's what I've heard, too. I, yeah. I haven't talked to Joan, but I'd love to hear <laughs> more yeah. from her. But yeah, well, that's but my it, understanding. She like... executed it, which is, you know, typical. They had a pretty big office. And so yeah. while they were, you know, conceiving of ideas, they definitely had a team of people to execute all of that, you know, pre-computer land. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the map is introduced. It's 1972. And uh, John, what was the? Do you remember what the uh, the reaction when you when you first saw the uh, the map in seventy two? You want me to be honest? Sure. <laughs> I took one look at it and I said, "This ain't New York." Yeah. I uh, I I actually have another frame map here. This is a this is a nineteen forty eight. New York City subway map, and I took a piece of tissue paper, and I tried to draw the then existing color coding system in a geographical perspective, using the Hagstrom map as the base, and I realized immediately that the then existing color coding system could not be handily used uh, in a geographic uh, I, uh, the Vignelli map came out in what, I don't know, June, July, 1972. Uh, my first published maps were published by New York Magazine in, 19, in January of 1972. And as many of you know, I am not a trained uh, graphic designer. Uh, I was an English lit major. Uh, which qualifies you for everything. Uh, I, I had set out to write about undercover passageways in Midtown, and I realized that what I was writing was an instant cure for insomnia. And so I thought, well, you know, what can I do? I, so I started charting them, and I showed my roughs to New York Magazine, and they thought they liked them. And they handed my roughs off to a graphic designer who metamorphosed my roughs into the finished product. Uh, so I, I mean, I was already basically in the map world more by serendipity than anything. Um, I wound up uh, writing the travel guides, I mean, the guidebooks, the coaster bus loops, and the MTA liked what I. Done. Okay, John. John, can you can you get a little closer, uh, a little closer to the microphone? We're just having a little trouble here. Uh, my machine is turned all the way up, so. Oh, that that sounds better. Is that better? Yep, uh, that's great. The, uh, Thank you. The then executing executive director of the MTA liked the uh, guidebooks and asked if I'd be interested in writing a travel guide to New York City, and I said yes. Uh, and as an integral part of the travel guide was uh, a new subway map, uh, which was truly geographic uh, because we didn't have time. So this was the fall of 74 that I was hired and NTA wanted the guidebook finished and out by the spring of 76 because of 
1976. Uh, so uh, I taught with the graphic designer who was who was uh, on uh, who was hired by the MTA to do other things, Mike Hertz. And Mike said, "Well, we don't we don't have time we to start a map from scratch." So we'll take a city planning commission, uh, commission map and surprint the routes of the subway on that map. And, that, and that's when the problem with color coding started because the, the transit authority would not budge uh, and let the tail wag the dog, as it were, and have the map uh, have have a map with new subway route colors uh, with the rest of the system using the old colors. Mm -hmm. So we came out with a monochromatic map, one color with travel with with the color coded discs running alongside the map. And in 1976. Uh, a subway map committee had been started at the Transit Authority, and I wound up chairing the map and doing battle all the while with the MTA, with, with the Transit Authority, hoping to get a new color coding system. But John, can I can I can I ask you one thing? Was there a, a like a a backlash within the 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 TA at that point? Was there like people were up in arms about the the Vignelli map? being like inaccurate or I'm just trying to get a sense of like what precipitated the the change and then also what precipitated the debate itself. Well, what precipitated the change uh, was that there was there, there was there was there was no revolution per se. It was very slow moving. Uh, but what what people thought was important was to put the subway in perspective with the city it serves. And the Vignelli approach had the subway operating in a void. And one of the first things I said at the debate was, I'm a New Yorker, and New York does not look like the Vignelli representation. And it just made sense to me, and it made sense to others at the MTA to show the map in perspective with the city it serves. And, you know, there, there was no statement saying, we're up in arms over the Vignelli map. That, that never happened. Uh, and as I also said at the debate, uh, the Vignelli map was uh, a good seller for the MTA, and it was on t-shirts and on dresses and things. Uh, it was on mugs. Um, so it wasn't that the MTA was particularly unhappy with the Vignelli map. Uh, I might have been and others might have been, but it was not dogma uh, that they were unhappy with it. Uh, so in dribs and drabs, uh, we started getting a map and uh, in the spring of 1978, uh, so it was a committee, you know, and there were representatives, experts on transit from the Transit Authority and from the MTA. And there were, there were public activists who volunteered their time. And one of them was a, as a psychologist, a professor at Lehman, and she took it under her wing uh, to test the map. And uh, there was a wonderful guy, or there was still always a wonderful guy named Ben Blom, who operated City Anna Gallery, and who was also in the publishing business. And we were talking about the map. And he said, well, you know, hey, gang, I've got a great idea. Why don't we put on a show here? So we did. We mounted a history of New York City subway maps. And the capstone was to the presentation was the iteration that we had, which depicted the subway monochromatically. And, uh, you know, a good percentage 
you know, good enough for the Senate to pass something with a majority of 66, is it? Uh, I liked the idea of geographic approach. But many people said, but we miss a color coding system that works, which we knew full well was the problem. Yeah. So that was your next uh, evolution of, of your, your version of the map with the color coding system. Yes. Uh, I, I had believed from the get-go that it should be modeled on the London Underground system, uh, trunk lines. And there, there is a difference in New York between the subway system and all other you know, metros and undergrounds, et cetera, in that we have system, a system that has lines coming together and going apart. Like a trunk of a tree, actually, with branches up at the top and roots down at the bottom. Um, but a trunk line color coding system worked because uh, it could be accommodated and show the routing accurately in at least midtown. Uh, but the, uh, so we tested the map and it, you know, it looked good from one perspective. Uh, and then uh, the end of August, 1978, just before Labor Day, I was asked by a woman named Phyllis Cerf Wagner, who was the widow of Bennett Cerf, the publisher, and then married to former Mayor Wagner. And she was a dollar a year consultant at the MTA on aesthetics. And she asked me how we were progressing. And I told her that we were dead in the water. And she wanted to know why. And I told her, she said, well, will you show me something? So a fellow who worked for Mike Kurtz, Nobu Sarasi, over Labor Day weekend, uh, drew about half a dozen different iterations of this trunk line color coding. I frankly didn't care which color was accorded to what trunk line. And uh, in fact, I mean, this is a very pale thing I'm going to show to you, but. Is that the original one that they drew, that Nobu drew? It's one of Nobu's drawings, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I keep it face to the wall because it's fading. <laughs> So, so did you, I'm wondering, did you, uh, did you ever talk to Vignelli? Did you, had you met Vignelli before the night of the uh, debate? No. 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 Uh, you know, he said his piece and he, he modeled much of his talk on what other, what other systems do. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a fan, you know, look, look like my, coffee cup it's the london underground map i have a london underground wall map sitting over there um but you know robert kiley who had headed the mta for a while went to london and headed their transit system there and he looked at the london underground map having to go somewhere i don't know and he took his you know he thought he was going to the right place he was miles away from where he had to be um and that's, you know, that's a problem with schematic maps. Uh, Geogra you know, I can almost hear Tevye singing, perspective. You know, you've got to put, put the subway in perspective with the city of Serbs. And I think that with Nobu uh, making the final mechanical, you know, we were talking about pre-computer artwork here. There were 12 layers. This, the first printing of the subway map was two passes on a six color press and we had to go to Cincinnati, Ohio in order to do it. Uh, it was monstrous, uh, but uh, Nobu and the, the guys at my Kurtz Associates uh, put together the mechanical that worked. And the difference between the map that was tested, I've shown it to you, uh, this was the this is the test map. This is the one that was shown. Can you see it? That's the map that was shown. Yeah, can't really see much detail, but I get the idea. There, you get a rough idea. And this is this is the map that was published in uh, by I guess it was June nineteen seventy. Yeah. 
know, when, when, when you think about the response uh, to the map, I've, I've written down these words. Uh, in, in July of 1979, the New York Times wrote an editorial uh, with the headline, The Best Subway Map in Years. Paul Goldberger, who was the architectural critic for the Times at the, time, at the time, wrote a story on the map with the headline, At Last, A Usable Subway Map. Uh, there was a story by Tony Hiss in, in, in Talk of the Town, in New Yorker, who said, finally, a map that shows the actual routing of the subways. And the map won a uh, commendation for design excellence uh, given by the US Department of Transportation and the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, you know, they, they can put that stuff on my tombstone. As far as <laughs> um, is part of the issue, I think like what, what came out in the debate that I thought was interesting was that, um, <clears throat> that there were supposed to be Vignelli said there were supposed to be three maps that the MTA had commissioned from them. And in the in the, the standards manual for the MTA signage, you see three squares that are supposed to be holding these maps. Uh, the, the, um, the system map, which is what Vignelli basically said, you know, what was issued, a geographic map, and then uh, like a neighborhood map or a how to get there map. Um, and that, that he, he, he seems to, um, you know, uh, put forth that the reason was that, that it shouldn't have been judged. His map should not have been judged on its own without these other two maps that were supposed to be part of the system, but that the MTA hadn't paid to make those other maps. Since I was not part of it, I do not know the veracity. However, uh, the MTA uh, is a government organization, and sometimes things have a way of falling through the cracks. Mm. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it can be a General Motors and the same thing will happen. Uh, we, uh, when the new subway map was, was, was published, we went to the next step. And we did start implementing a neighborhood map system, which is basically the second part of the threesome that Vignelli uh, was advocating. Uh, because even with a, I mean, I, in all honesty, the, the 1979 map was not a truly geographic map. It's really a quasi geographic map. Uh, you know, we extended the width of Manhattan and we congested. I mean, if you look at the Rockaways, for instance, is the Rockaways look nothing uh, in reality the way it's depicted on the map. Uh, but it, it shows things, it does put things in perspective. Uh, but if you get out of the subway and you want to get from the subway station to the street that is not on the quasi geographic map, a neighborhood map is very helpful. So we did them. Um. I wanted to maybe uh, talk now with um, Felipe Memoria from Work & Co, who fast forward, uh, you know, to last year, uh, began working on a, a digital uh, redesign of the subway map. I think some of the some of the issues, um, you know, between obviously mapping and, um, you know, location are, 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 are and were and are technical issues that now, um, you know, with digital technology and with um, the MTA kind of upgrading the subway system to have actual data um, kind of maybe changed some of these, uh, some of these things. So um, Felipe, are you? Uh... Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, hi. Okay. I wonder if your, uh, what was your take on the subway map? I mean, how did you come to, I mean, you're from, you're from Brazil. When did you, do you remember when you first saw the New York subway map? I uh, remember when I visited New York, um, I think it was for, for the first time was 2003. And, um, you know, 
I remember my friend that lived here already explained to me how it worked. And, um, you know, I think uh, I have to say I over trusted the geographical accuracy of the map. And <laughs> I think probably everybody had a, an experience that is similar to this one. Uh, but I got around, you know, I got eventually I learned and I got around, of course, it was the express trains and things like that, that also uh, caught me off guard and, and you know, weekend uh, changes and things like that. I think we all had experiences like that. But, um, but yeah, I think the, you know, basically just talking a little bit about what we did, I think, you know, what we try to do, and that was an idea that came from the MTA, like they had the product called the Weekender. And the Weekender used the later version of the Vignelli diagram, as everybody here knows, right? Uh, from 2008 that he did for Men's Vogue. And then eventually uh, they were working on something like that for the Weekender product. And then they were like, oh, actually Massimo just updated the map using Tarnox colors who were a big innovation and a big you know, improvement on, on his previous map. Uh, so why don't we just use it? So Vignelli you know, gave, gave the solution, gave the map uh, to the MTA to be used on the Weekender. So eventually they were like, oh, well, maybe we should do a smarter version of the Weekender because the problem with the Weekender, if everybody here remembers, is that the map was kind of a PDF. And, and the problem, what, you know, the content of the Weekender is basically telling people what happens during a uh, change of service, especially late at night or during the weekend. So they couldn't have, you know, a design team on retainer designing a new map and changing the map every day or for every weekend, depending on what they would need the map to represent, right? So the Weekender had a basically text uh, explaining the changes, which is the same content we have in the posters on the walls and, you know, inside of the stations that I think, again, we've all been there and try to read the posters. Sometimes they're confusing, sometimes they're they're, you know, get it, but that's the best they could do with the medium they had, which is, you know, printing stuff, right? So you print the maps, you can't just keep printing the maps and designing new maps all the time. And I think digital came to sort of evolve that and help a little bit, right? So we designed a solution that adapts itself depending on what's happening in the system as we speak, basically right now or, you know, live. And, and therefore you don't need, in theory, you know, one day you won't need to print all the maps. Um, and every time you look at the, the map, it's exactly what the system is at that moment. So of course, to design that, to get to that solution, we had to, you know, do our research uh, just the way you did yours too, Gary, and, uh, and dive deep in everything that happened and try to learn as much as we could, right? Um, about what, you know, John came up with back in the day and, and Massimo and other designers and designers from, from other cities around the world. And, and um, basically our solution was kind of rational, super rational. There were two major uh, decisions that we made to come up with what we eventually did as far as the design. So the first is that to show change of service and to reroute the trains, the lines, we had to use the paradigm that Massimo used in the diagram, which is one line per train. Because if you had the, the trunk lines the way John did, you can't really represent all those changes in a clear way. The, the map had to be flexible enough to be changed completely and still look like it was professionally designed. And, and this is, you know, this is the beautiful version. It's, you can understand what's going on. So we had to use one line per train. So that's the first decision that we locked down. And then the second one is that, you know, of course, you know, to John's point, we wanted to make it geographically accurate. And even Vignelli, I think, agreed, you know, in the debate and in everything he, he talked about before that that was also necessary, was part of his system. And I think the, you know, another very important thing for us to the reality we live in right now is that we have those powerful devices like they have a powerful, you know, beautiful high resolution screen. They have GPS capabilities and so forth. So we thought that if we had that, you know, we could not do a product that didn't have that blue dot of the GPS telling you where you were. Because once we locked down the decision of the lines, the independent lines, we asked ourselves, well, why don't we just use the Vignelli uh, later, later diagram from the weekender then? Well, we can't because we want to have that blue dot. And if you put the blue dot there in the diagram, it's going to be a mess because it's going to be completely inaccurate. It's not going to help. It's actually going to be worse, right? So eventually we, we came up with this idea of actually connecting the two universes and, and doing like this hybrid model where one would adapt to the other. So 
it's always the geography, it's always the city, right? But as you keep zooming in, the lines that were organic, they start to get a little more geometrical for clarity. And then we start, and we have this opportunity too with digital of, you know, simplifying and making decisions depending on each Zoom level that you are. So what type of information do you show, right? You know, neighborhoods that John introduced in his map, for example, that, you know, Vignelli wouldn't have in his map and parks and things like that. So we started introducing those things as you zoomed in. But it was important to have the geography because we really wanted that GPS blue dot to tell you where you are because that was going to be very useful, right? So with those two sort of decisions locked down, you know, the one train by line, uh, one line per train, and the, the sort of geographical aspect of it, we sort of made this proof of concept to see if it would work to put the two together. And it kind of worked. And as we built, we started to improve it and so forth. And we're still improving it. There's a lot to do. Uh, but that was kind of, you know, the how it all came about. Uh, and yeah. again, standing uh, on the shoulders of giants and getting all the knowledge out there and trying to build on top of all these great designers, uh, build on top of their work. Yeah, I, I definitely want to talk a little bit more about like um, data visualization and sort of the hierarchy of information that, uh, and this is for anything of maps or web pages or, or, or whatever. Um, as graphic designers, um, you know, it's it seems so critical. I, I, maybe I'll, I'll bring in Jesse here for a sec to talk a little bit about um, maybe a little more of that, and then we're going to open it up and and we'll all talk a little bit more and throw out a few questions for the whole the whole group, um, and then also um, take some questions from all of you out there. So please use the Q and A. Uh, function down there to uh, enter a question. Um, hi, Jesse. Hello. So as I came up with this idea to, um, you know, maybe publish this as a book uh, with the transcript of the debate that from the, the Voices Project and the photographs from Stan Reese. And of course, um, the first per person I, the first people I talked to were you and Hamish. Um, you've obviously you know, kind of well, standards manual is was a, a really the founding of your of your uh, of your company, um, and uh, you've 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 gone on to do um, so much more, uh, you know, amazing um, graphic design publishing and you know, um, really uh, you know history the history of, of of graphic design on so many levels. So, um, what uh what what is it to you? Why 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 the sub why the MTA graphics? Why the maps? Why 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 were you so interested in this stuff? Well, not to give a disappointing answer, but if uh, the people know, if anyone on this call, you know, knows the story of how we sort of really stumbled upon that original red binder of Vignelli's, uh, you know, original system for the signage system, not even including the map, it was really just the guidelines for the signage to begin with. I mean, that was sort of a thing that um, Hamish and I stumbled upon and uh, was simply, you know, uh, gave us the idea to share that information. And I think um, then that sort of uncovered a lot of uh, interesting sort of um, perspectives that we got from designers and just transit enthusiasts and people who live in New York who may have not uh, considered the subway signs a piece of design. I think, you know, if you're not a designer aware of typography or color or design systems, the way that, you know, simple dots mean, you know, the place that you're at and how that's like a, uh, there's a logic to that. I think people just saw the signs as existing in their environment and they were the subway every day. And it just was, you know, a piece of metal that got them from, you know, uh, A to B. Um, so I think that's interesting just in the sense of bringing some sort of perspective to urban environments. Um, uh, and, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, one map or the other, I think just the, the public interest in, I don't know, uh, these design decisions that I don't know, probably many people on this call are aware of, but the, the public um, isn't. Um, I think that was sort of a, a really great outcome of the entire of the first book and then all the books that we've done since then. So just sort of this public awareness of, of urban design and, and design for public information rather than selling a product. Um, so I think that's sort of like the most interesting aspect of all of this, regardless mm -hmm. of which map we're rooting for or not. 
um, maybe talk a little bit about the um, process of, of uh, designing the book itself. Um, the, 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 um, so the, the, the cover design is really inspired by the actual um, invite for the, for, the, for the debate, which is also inside, inside here. And that sort of just like led the whole direction Right. Yeah. I mean, again, not to give a, a disappointing answer, but it's sort of like designed itself in the sense of, you know, we, we didn't, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, impose any design decisions that weren't already influenced by something existing. So, yeah, like you said, I'm the format. I have my copy here. Like it's, it's the same exact format of the original invitation. So we just started there and then um, in our typical sort of standards manual order style, we just set the whole thing in this in Clem's beautiful monospace uh, pitch typeface um, as sort of like a, a neutralizer. I mean, I know we talk about like Helvetica as a neutral typeface, but because it actually, and this is something I, you know, am interested in talking about or hearing what other people think is around how Helvetica and, you know, uh, standard medium and eventually Helvetica and Vignelli's map really became an identity for the city, um, it no longer becomes neutral because it represents what I think is New York City. And, you know, in Paula's, um, uh, what do we call the forward, uh, you know, she explains that how even, you know, when she was living in New York at the time, she sort of um, was, I think, in opposition to Vignelli's map, but now really looks at it as you know, the identity of New York City. And I agree with that. So um, I think that's sort of interesting is like when you're dealing with this subject matter, you can't use Helvetica or standard medium as sort of a neutralizer because it is actually a visual um, identifier of the city, which I think, uh, you know, is a result of the map in the system. Um, and at the same time, sort of understanding the flaws of it um, and to John's points, uh, you know, which are extremely valid. And I sort of, you know, sometimes become too democratic about it. And I struggle with which one is better, you know, so we sort of praise aesthetics or, um, you know, really focus on the, the usability of it. But in any case, I do think it's interesting um, that the results did become this visual identity when that wasn't the uh, intention or the assignment at all. That's interesting. <clears throat> um, the the book is is also now sold out. I don't know. If, <laughs> hopefully, people have on this on this uh, uh, watching this have gotten a copy. Um, but the first printing sold out, which is amazing to me. I didn't think there were thousands of people who would <laughs> who would want to <laughs> um, read this. But uh, but I guess there are other design geeks uh, like us out there. Um, but um, we are doing a reprint. I know there are a couple few copies left at the standards manual shop if you're in New York. And then also um, you J Crew with some J Crew stores may also have copies of the book. Uh, exactly. They ordered some. And so if you are in the US, call your local J Crew store and see or <laughs> uh, uh, or or we're in the process of doing a, another reprint. Um, with some a few little revisions, but um, but it's been so great working with you guys on on putting this together. It was just like, again, like I didn't really think of any any. Uh, you were the first people I like called about it just because it made made so much sense. Yeah, it was it was our pleasure, um, and yeah, I think you know it sort of goes with uh, the catalog of our of our other titles. So yeah, it was a it was a no brainer. But um, yeah. J. Crew, hopefully another reprints, or um, yeah, our shop in Brooklyn, which you can go. I'm sure we'll put this in the chat, but um, it's, uh, it's in Greenpoint in Brooklyn, 212 Franklin Street, if anyone is around. Um, so let's, I would love to bring everybody back again and uh, maybe talk a little bit more about this. Uh, it, uh, one of the things that I uh, was or asked, I, I guess, is when I, when I um, wanted to uh, have the idea of the book is like, why, why is this important? Why is this interesting? And to me, it's about design history. And, um, you know, I'm, a, um, I'm obsessed with with these things. And, and when I when I find out there's something that, you know, people don't know yet, I get excited about it and obsessed with the idea of, uh, of, of, you know, publishing it in some some way um you know d doing a whole book about a two-hour conversation that happened in 1978 might seem a little specific 
But um, I also made a whole feature film about one font, so I guess like the specificity is my uh, is my is my mo. But um, but is there um something that I was trying to get out before is like this idea of like the i the the um the concepts that were that were at the heart of the debate, um this idea of um of visual communication and data visualization and like um that that usability of something like a map um you know there are all these different kind of um, hierarchies and and um levels of importance of information that we see we see so much information now like that for me was the the one of the um things that that i felt made this idea still really valid even though we've all got phones and we all don't really you know need paper maps anymore it's this idea of um a visual uh in so much visual information and how, how do we kind of you what's the best way to use all this information that we're like thrown at all day um that's not really a question but <laughs> i'd love to hear all of your thoughts about it <laughs> um i sort of uh, you know, uh, not to plug another project that I worked on, but when, when I was at Pentagram before doing order standards manual, you know, the walk NYC map uh, maps that were designed, you know, with Michael Beirut and a few other teams. And so that was with, um, you know, the DOT. And that, that's just an interesting project to bring up because it, it does follow the Vignelli language, um, but they are printed physical maps that are on, you know, the corners of, uh, I don't know, every five blocks in New York City or eventually in uh, all five boroughs. And um, I like a lot of the questions that Pentagram got and Michael and people who worked on that project were, why are they printed? Why aren't they digital? And I think there was something about the sort of uh, literal concreteness of them is that you didn't have to look at your phone all the time and you could look at the city and look up rather than at your phone while you're walking, you know, down Sixth Avenue or Broadway or in Chinatown, wherever you are. And I think there's something to be said about that, um, you know, not to sort of, you know, discount the beautiful work um, that Philippe and, you know, Working Co made. I think there's like room for both, but those maps in particular, um, and they were, you know, sort of monochromatic. They sort of just had a gray, green, color palette there were no subway lines to follow but they were just sort of the street level maps and so you know that followed the uh, visual language of the Vignelli system but I think also encouraged people to get off their phones and have it there as a sort of a staple and something that they could rely on um, and they were geographically accurate um, so there's something with that so I think that project is just interesting maybe to throw out there as sort of an extension of uh, of the underground I think, I think building on top of that too it was uh... I was reading the book that uh, John was questioning, you know, um, the the choice that Massimo and John made about having the water, you know, muted down and, you know, in, in, in a brownish and so forth. I think that's, you know, in my mind, he was basically trying to do what you're saying, Gary, of like really focusing the map on the lines, you know, like it's all about the colored lines. And by doing that, he's kind of, you know, fading out all the information that could sort of fight for the attention of the person using the map, right? So that's why I think the first version of the map didn't have, you know, blue water and, and green parks. That said, in the later version, they decided to incorporate, the colors are still muted because he didn't want it, you know, those colors to fight with the lines. Uh, but it looks nice as well. That, that's the version that we kind of used as a base for our map. Like we got the colors from, from that version. Like I was saying in the beginning, we even considered using that map altogether, that diagram altogether, right? Like we should say. But I think it's really, Gary, to your point, like that sort of balance between clarity and density of information, right? So uh, the solution that they came up with at Unimark uh, was basically to have maps that did their job really well, like they were as clear as possible about doing one job really well. So the diagram did a job really well, which was how do I get, how do I get from point A to point B? And then the geographical map would actually do another job really well, which is I'm going to that street, to that corner, what's the closest station, right? And then there was a verbal map too. There was a different thing that actually I think is fascinating. I wonder if we should try to do that one day, which is for, you know, according to Massimo, the other half of people that couldn't read maps so well. 
But I think that, you know, the idea was to try to, you know, it's a very classic, like traditional modernist idea of trying to simplify, simplify, simplify to get to the core of what that product really needs to do and just do a really great job at that, right? So, but that required more maps, right? That required, it was like, let's say, potentially a more expensive solution. He says in the book that it was not, but I could see it being a little more expensive. And in the book, they mentioned too, that the, the solution that, that John did with Michael Hurt's team and, and, and the committee at the MTA at the time was kind of doing, you know, a good job, good enough job at the two sort of main tasks. Right? How do I get from point A to point B? And also is point B close to where I need to go? Right? So it's doing those two jobs in a single map, maybe not as clearly uh, with more you know, information, a little more dense, but it was also more economical, right? So you have that sort of, you know, I, I, think, I think both are fair solutions. There's not a single design solution for, for a given problem. And I think they have very hard I think job, you know, very difficult task, which is solving all that for a very complex system and, and in print, right? Uh, but I think that kind of, that's, kind of, that's kind of the debate, right? Do you go all pure and it's a little pricier and, you know, but arguably better in my opinion, or do you go, uh, you know, in a, in a solution that is a little, it's good enough and it's more economical, more practical, more pragmatic, let's say, to use a, a word that John uh, likes to use. So I think that's kind of the, the, the interesting, you know, debate here. Like it's, I think both solutions are, are valid and, you know, you can go, you can go both ways. Um, but in the ideal world, maybe, you know, I think if Massimo uh, perhaps specified a little more or, or, or was a little more intense in his recommendations and, and perhaps, you know, designed the, the other maps and delivered them, and, and was a little stronger on that side, maybe the MTA would have implemented them as well. And then, this, and then the, I think the debate would be a little more fair because it would be a complete solution against a complete solution as opposed to a complete solution against a half solution or one third of a solution, right? Uh, if, if I may, may I? Does anybody hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead, John. Uh, the, the idea that Vignelli simplified, simplified, simplified is true, uh, but it was, as I like to say, reductio ad absurdum. Uh, there, there was no attempt at imparting critical information, such as when service actually operated on the map. All that you found at a station was a dot. Now, what does that mean? It means that, does it mean that the train stops there weekdays uh, only or weekends only, or is it a rush hour service only, et cetera? Uh, the 1979 map at least indicated that there was full, full time service, and I, I forget what the typographic trick was, but it might have been bold face Roman or something and part-time service and regular weight italic or something. It was a flip of the coin, whatever. But it took the map to a more didactic level. And after all, the point of a map is really to get somebody where he has to go uh, as easily uh, as possible. And if you're standing there at 81st Street in Central Park West on a Saturday afternoon awaiting the B to arrive, you're going to be standing there until Monday morning until it gets there. So I think that's a critical thing to, to talk about. Uh, also, there was no attempt at delineating express versus local service unless there was a dot at a station. Well, you know, you can use circles or ovals and put the service within the circle and oval to indicate express service at that station or a square or a rectangle with a number or letter within it to, to identify a local station. Uh, there, was, there was none of that attempted. Uh, it was as if everything was, uh, was very democratic. All, all service was created equal when it ain't. <laughs> I, I think that... Um, can, I, can I ask a question, Gary? Sorry. Sure. So, John, but uh, wouldn't 
wouldn't that be fixable, let's say, with like a box with like explanation, like a legend with explanations, uh, like you did in your map? Well, on on the seventy nine map, we 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 have a verbal description of the operation of each line, uh, and on the back of the nineteen seventy nine map, uh, we had strip maps grouped by trunk line because we didn't have enough room to have individual true strip maps. A strip map is a non-geographic depiction of the operation of the subway line. Uh, but on the strip maps, we showed intermodality. We showed all the connections with buses and with buses to airports, with railroads, etc. Uh, so there was much more information imparted on the 79 map than uh, on the usual map. Uh, some, uh, if I remember correctly, the Vignelli maps would ordinarily have an enlargement of Midtown and Lower Manhattan and maybe downtown Brooklyn on the back, uh, but no strip maps. Uh, there, there are still things missing on the MTA maps that I incorporate in my own maps. If you're told to go to Zariga Avenue in the Bronx, oh, where is it? The only way that you can find by looking at a map is to start, if looking in the Bronx, start 246th Street, Van Cortlandt Park. You go through about 50 stations before you get to Zariga Avenue. Well, what do you, what, what do, you do? You have an index of stations, very simple. And you can impart more information than where you'll find the station on it with grid coordinates. You can include the service at the station and you can color code that service depending on when the service serves that station. You can have all the intermodality, you can have all the connections to buses, and trains, etc. cetera. Uh, you can also tell whether it's a station that is handicap accessible or whether it is a station that does not allow you to reverse your direction at it. So you have to be careful when you're entering the station to make sure that you're entering the entrance that is downtown only if you want to go downtown and not uptown, et cetera. There's so much more of the information that can be imparted. Sure, but it seems, John, it seems like that just the, the complexity and the like dysfunction of the New York subway system and the fact that it was kind of cobbled together from <clears throat> multiple different independent subway lines and kind of mashed together in this uh, uh, ridiculous <laughs> way is, is maybe part of this um, this challenge. It's like you, Massimo, Felipe, you're all trying to kind of map something, a, a service that is like legendarily um, variable uh in terms of it's you know no fixed routes and just things are skipping stations one time or the other it, it in some ways i think it's um kind of just an, an impossible task and and so many people have done have done the best jobs they can with the technology that they they are presented with and even felipe would <clears throat> i'm sure uh say that there's room for you know more improvement and you know more more technology and and more uh uh this this like brings me to something i keep thinking about this idea of like digital technology and um versus like paper or analog technology and and i feel like this is maybe um why the archives are so important like i mean like jennifer when you go through the the archives that at, at, um at RIT at the Vignelli Center, like what, what is, um, what are the lessons, I guess? Like, what do you, what, what do you, what do you, what do you, uh, why should people still be interested in kind of like design history from the print era and like what, what it can kind of, or how, how it translates to digital? Wow, what a good question. Um, let me think about that. Um, <laughs> well, that's part of huh. what this is, I can think well, kind of about for me, you know, it's just like, you know, th there is so much to kind of still be discussed and still be discovered um, and, and how that relates to, you know, digital technology now. Yeah, I think um, 
I don't know if I can connect it exactly to the <laughs> subway map in this question, but what it makes me think of is there are other examples in print, which has its own challenges that um, are good information design solutions that could be applied to digital. Um, one thing that comes to mind, I wish I had a slide to show you, but um, are the Audubon field guides, which um, Vanelli designed and they have, you know, sort of the information broken down into pieces, which is just like a website, right? Like there's an opening part where it has icons. So if you're chasing butterflies, <laughs> you can't read through a whole book to try to find the butterfly you just saw. You need some, a quick way to get there. And anyway, I won't go into detail without, if anyone wants to see pictures, just contact me. But um but I also think like every day I, well, almost every day, I, I haven't cloned myself, so I can't do it every single day, but we have classes that are coming and they're doing work digitally. Um, and they're looking at these historic materials to find inspiration and to, you know, see how these problems were solved in the past, right? Um, I mean, I mentioned to Gary in an email that um, specifically about the subway map that we had honors students coming. It started with an art history professor, Sarah Thompson, here at RIT, who brought her honors class. And their theme was something like discovering spaces and cities or spaces and places or something, you know. And so they had to do maps, but none of them were, well, not all of them are design students, but they had to think about mapping. And so one of the things she had them do was have their own debate. And sort of on the spot, I mean, they didn't have a lot of experience with these maps, but they had to debate the Vanelli versus John's map, right? Sort of on the spot. And um, sometimes Vanelli would win and sometimes John would win, you know, like they would have a different perspective, even <laughs> with contemporary students, like they have different reactions, right? You know, um, and that, you know, brought other classes from these honors classes because they're thinking about having to make a map and they aren't necessarily designers. And so uh, I think, right, they need something to reference, <laughs> right? And seeing these pieces is somewhere to start anyway. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. <laughs> archives. Might... I mean, I don't know how to give you the whole value of archives in, in, on the spot, but anyway. They're so amazing. The past helps us better occupy the present, I think. Oh, wait, say that again, right? Knowing about the past just helps us better occupy the present in whatever we're doing, I think. Design anything else. <laughs> Definitely. Um, well, it's awesome that all that. Um, you're going to continue to put out more of the um, of the recordings and the the history from the Great Hall on the website. Um, I I want to like maybe like one more random thing that I've been thinking about along these lines, especially when it comes to mapping, <clears throat> is um you know we don't get lost anymore. Or, or maybe we get lost when our we don't have like very much cell service and we're like where where am I, oh, I, I you know but this idea that um before you know digital technology and and Google Maps or whatever it is you had to you needed a paper map you had to use a paper map to get around like I can't let you know imagine in 1974 if I'm a tourist coming to New York City oh here's this free thing I get in the subway oh this is New York and I, I you know trying to navigate the city with that um, would be very different than how we would navigate New York City now and but I, and I wonder like is it Yes, it's that's accurate and I can find out where I am and I can find out exactly how many steps I need to go to turn this way and this way. But is that kind of a good thing? Have we have we sort of lost that sense of um, exploration of a city or, um, you know, this chance kind of discoveries you, you had to negotiate? You had to talk to people. You had to ask for directions. You had to ask, you know to try to figure out where you were and you discovered things that you maybe weren't expecting. So it's one of those areas that I think maybe like, yes, I, 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 you know, I appreciate knowing exactly where I am at all times and how to get from point A to point B, but is, is that really the point sometimes? 
this is for anybody who wants to comment on it. <laughs> but it's, uh, I find it a very interesting point that you're making. Uh, years ago, in the 1970s probably, I was fearful that we were raising a generation of cartographic illiterates. <laughs> and the case, the, the, the problem has become exacerbated. And people are not learning the relationship between things anymore. You know, if you turn on your contraption on your automobile and you say, I am now at X and I want to get to Y, you know, you'll be told, yeah, you know, go three blocks and turn left and turn right after 17. You're not going to remember any of that. You're not going to have it stored in your brain so you can call it up again. And I, I have a simple standard for helping people on the street who look confused. If they're looking at their iPhones, uh, I don't bother. But if somebody has a paper map, I will stop and ask. And if it's a man and woman, I'll always be sure to ask the man if he needs <laughs> any assistance. And I'm more than happy to impart anything I know about the city. Uh, I'm shocked that you still see people with paper maps on the on yeah, the streets. Well, thank God. I mean, I I mean, I am a Carter guy. I, I am a, a techno jerk, and it's a miracle that I can use Adobe Illustrator. <laughs> the, the the idea of using an actual I don't know cell phone or something for me to get from A to B is totally beyond my ken. I have a. Yeah, I have an interesting, I think, I think interesting story about it. So the, the first version we did for, for this product was actually not a map. Um, it, it was how to get from point A to point B. It was a very simple UI. You know, I thought it was cheaper to build and easier for everybody. It was just basically like a gigantic icon, you know, the iconic circles of the lines. So we were in Dumbo, right? Uh, so it was like the F train orange circle with a clock around it, basically like you're here, where do you want to go? You would type where you want to go and the map would be a straight line similar to what you see inside of the trains. Just like, you know, do this, do that, do that, and that's it, right? And, uh, and, and the MTA came back to us and was like, well, this is beautiful, but you just redesigned my MTA. That's what it does. <laughs> uh, maybe one day we can use that design for the my MTA, but we really need the map. And the reason why we need the map is because New Yorkers don't want to be told how to get from point A to point B. They're all proud to know the system. They want to make their decisions. They know exactly how, how to go about it. And uh, I thought it was a fascinating, you know, uh, fascinating thing about the culture of the city, you know, of like being like, no, don't tell me how to get from here to here. I know exactly how to do it, you know, um, and I don't trust your software. Just, just give me the map. They just wanted the map. Um, and then the other thing that we did to sort of help on that is a controversial design decision, actually, because my intention was to help on people understanding the system as opposed to just getting exactly the information they want right away. So when service changes, you know, some of you might have noticed that we actually keep the original map faded in the background. So let's say that, you know, again, the, you know, orange line, if it, if it reroutes itself to another place, the original uh, orange line, it's faded away, faded down, but it's still there. And the reason to keep it like that was because in my mind, uh, because of the, the, the physical wayfinding, because imagine you go to York Street in Dumbo and then you look, oh, this is the F train, but, and then you look at the, the live map and it says that actually the A blue train is running there. And you're like, oh, wait, what's going on? Am I in the right place? Like, I think, you know, so it's important to actually look, I thought, to look at the map and understand, oh, normally this is, you know, this is the orange F train, but now I can see that it's faded out and it's been, you know, now it's the A train that is coming here. So that's a decision that made the map a little more cluttered and harder to build, you know, uh, but at the same time, I thought it could really help people on really understanding what's going on. If they are there at the station, looking at the wayfinding, they can say, okay, this is the original, this is what's happening now, you know? So it's more on the educational side, on people learning, because I think it's one of the problems of GPS, right? Like you put your GPS in the car, you put ways, you never actually learn the path you're doing all the time, right? 
because it's just following the GPS. Uh, but this way, I thought it was, you know, a little more educational for people to really understand what's going on. But you could argue that actually you could just like simplify it further, delete the original and just show exactly what it is right now, right? Um, anyways. Okay, I'm gonna stop asking my uh, weird questions and, um, and go to some questions from the, from the audience here. Uh, oh, Peter Lloyd from, uh, from the UK, uh, uh, who has also done some amazing books on the uh, subway, has a question for Jennifer. Uh, it's essentially all the original records for Massimo's creation of the map in 70 to 72 were discarded when Unimark New York's office closed. Do you think there's any chance the original documentation and sketches might still exist somewhere in private hands? Wouldn't that be awesome? Um, I, I don't know. It's a good possibility. There, people have squirreled things away. Things turn up all the time, right? I mean, Stan Reese found his negatives. We never know who's holding on to things. Um, I don't have any leads for subway materials. If that's Peter, certainly um, is an expert on the subway, um, and uh, probably knows more about it than I do. But um, yeah, I don't, I, we always hope there are things squirreled away. Hopefully someone will clear out their attic or their basement or their file cabinet and be like, oh, look at this. So um, there's always hope. <laughs> um, there's a question for uh, Felipe, which is, does working co plan on improving the map based on user data? That seems like this is from uh, Matt Argami Argominiz. Um, uh, it seems like a unique thing that technology allows us to do now, incorporate user data to the, for the improvements. Yeah, no, for sure. By the way, the other maps could be improved too with time, and they were, right? Um, we just need to print them all again. <laughs> but I think digital products are supposed to, to get better. Um, we, you know, I'm happy to report that we did a lot of amazing improvements. Right now we are actually testing to see if the, you know, things break and so forth. Uh, but I, I've been, you know, working with the team on polishing the map for, for the last year. Um, and one of the main things we're doing is actually to make it, uh, make the lines more uh, accurate to the reality that is happening underground. So, you know, in the next version of the map that we are, again, we're testing right now, you're going to see trains that go, you know, through the bridges, going through the bridges, you know, things like that. Uh, to, I think is you now it's a, it's a quality. And I saw there was another question about inconsistency, uh, you know, in different places, just so you guys know how, how the map was built. Basically we created, you know, Robert who built the map, the main engineer, he, he created some rules in the beginning to sort of start doing the map. Imagine like a, what you see is what you get tool that you can actually draw the map, you know, but then, you know, the code is actually writing itself for it. So he had a lot of rules on how to, uh, build the map, you know, rules that we came up before we finished the map. The map was, the process of the map was really like a collaboration between engineering and design, right? We never designed the full map. That, that'll that take three years, like like for John and for Massimo and, and Joan back in the day. We did it in 18 months. So basically we, we thought about the concept and we started like building it. It's, it, you know, Robert told me that that's called the, the walking skeleton. And we were like hammering that thing and polishing that thing for a long time. And the, the way he come, came up with the rules on how to actually draw the map through technology, we're using the 45 and 90 degrees from Harry Beck and then Massimo adopted later, right? Uh, and so we had those, some limitations for the current version of the map. Uh, and that's why sometimes like in some places you could see, oh, this, this seems inconsistent. It's not that geographical. Like, you know, it's like you're connecting some lines and that's the best we could do with the the code we had at the time. Now we're upgrading the code. We upgraded the code for, for more flexibility on those angles. So that's going to be the compromise. So it's still going to be clear. It's going to be, you know, hard to notice that the angles are not really, you know, 45 and 90, but by twisting a little bit, you can actually make uh, the lines more accurate to what's underground, which is a quality that, that, that the map can have. So that's the, that's what we're doing right now. And hopefully hmm. go live soon. Um, 
This is a, a interesting question from Lori Goodman. She says, can you address the question of racism slash marginalizing certain areas of the city in map making? And was it a factor in the 72 or 79 maps? It's very focused on the, you know, on the, the uh, obviously Man island of Manhattan and maybe not so much in the, the Bronx and other areas. I answer that? Yeah, that, yeah, sure. I, 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 I think the, the subway went there. We showed it. Very simple. Uh, I, period. <laughs> okay. Um, another question for for John or for anyone who would like to ask answer, what is your opinion of the subway maps of cities such as London, Berlin, or Milan? They're diagrammatic, and make it which makes it simple to travel while underground, um, and they're accompanied by other separate geographical maps. Well, schematic maps are schematic; they're diagrammatic. So. Uh... Diagram is meant to explain something, isn't it? So ideally, a schematic map explains something. Uh, if they're hand in glove with a geographic map, well, one complements the other. Uh, it's the question that basically uh, distinguishes uh, the debate. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> if anybody else would want to want to comment on other these other cities maps well this is another um i think an interesting comment um question from michael klein this is a long one but i'm, I'm going to read it so pretty much every great modernist project that has survived has had people complaining about it for years on utility grounds Think, for example, of the infamous floodings at Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth house, despite the fact that the house was designed to account for this. The Vignelli map, in my mind, is the same, yet these projects, if some might call them failures, are grand failures, failures that fostered cultures where people were inspired to aim higher, uh, that things might be uncontroversially work well and uncontroversially disappear from our memory. The question is whether or not you think the map was flawed, would you all agree that it's a cultural value and the fact that we're still here talking about it after 50 years maybe made it worth more than the annoyance of a few commuters? I would say that I don't think it was flawed. I think the, there was a flaw in the execution because if the other maps were printed, the geographical and, and perhaps the verbal and the neighborhoods one, uh, it would have been a different story just like any other map using the same paradigm around the world, you know, like talking about the other question, pretty much every large city in the world or city that you can consider a peer of New York as far as population size or, uh, you know, even like the complexity of the system, they all use that solution. And they've been using that solution ever since, you know, after I think London showed the way, you know, with, with Harry Beck. So I, I don't consider that uh like a uh, something that failed myself i think it was just unfortunately not implemented correctly and that caused other problems later and that's why it was replaced that's my take on it um on the farnsworth house by the way i'm not sure if he he got to visit but that tree Mies really wanted to make it close to that beautiful tree <laughs> that tree was fundamental <laughs> Anyone else have any thoughts on that that idea? I generally wouldn't mess with angry commuters. <laughs> yeah. One thing that I think was fascinating during the, the debate recording is just like these, you, you had like Rudy Deharek and all these like designers and, and you know, um, Arlene Bronzaft, the psych psychiatrist, psychologist who was in the mix and the 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 um the range of people and then you just had 
somebody that took the subway every day and just wanted to complain about it that they 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 you know they got on the wrong side of one of, uh, one of the stations because there wasn't a sign for it or something. It, it, if I, if I may, it, uh, I hadn't thought about the debate in a long time, obviously, until your book. Uh, the, you're right. Uh, the the questions that were asked were so frequently totally irrelevant to the fact. <laughs> uh, it was people just wanted to sound off on certain subjects, uh, and and you know even even people on the panel. Uh, I I forget his name. I tried to remember it, but uh, the, oh, Richard Harris. Uh, Richard Harris went in a digression on the history of typography, which is very interesting, uh, but I'm not sure it was really germane to the subject at hand. And that was, I mean, that was indicative of so many of the comments that were made by the public. Uh, if, if I may, on the subject of Helvetica, uh, you you might know that uh, I uh, I've abandoned Helvetica in my own maps. Uh, if, if sacrilege. Yeah, I know. That. If this is a C in Helvetica, I'm using myriad, and myriad cuts the C there. And in making a map, you know, every every pica counts. So if if you have a C that takes up less horizontal space and is still perfectly legible, well, I bless it. I mean, you know, I'm <laughs> myriad pro forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I want to thank all of you for joining me to talk about all this stuff and for participating in the project and everybody for um, coming out and uh, uh, being interested in all this stuff. And it's so great now that the, the debate recording, along with so many other amazing recordings, are up on the Voices from the Great Hall Project website. So you should definitely check that out. Um, uh, there are links in, uh, in this chat. There uh, is a YouTube archive of this uh, talk uh, at some point, which will be up. Uh, and there is a book that you can maybe find somewhere, uh, <laughs> Standards Manual Shop or your local J. Crew, or uh, you can pre-order the um, the second printing from our um, from our website. Uh, and um, yeah, and thanks so much to uh, Sasha and everyone from Cooper Union and Lou Ballin Center and. Uh, all the people who were were part of this project and um, and supported it. Um, so, yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's all we uh, that's all we got.